Good morning, everyone. Thank you for uh, worshiping with us. I see the sun is starting to shine here in Omaha right now, and wherever you are, I saw we had people from uh, Florida, California who are watching. We have uh, people from all over the country. It's just been really cool as we've been doing online worship. Our congregation is... Uh, Grown geographically for sure. So if you're a guest outside of Omaha, thank you for worshiping with us uh, this morning. Um, today we're going to continue our series, uh, A Better New Normal. Um, we're going to look at the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25. And I think this is perhaps um, the most profound chapter in all the Bible. If you were to ask me, you know, Craig, what chapter of the Bible should I read? If I could just give you one, I think it would probably be Matthew 25. So we can understand this through the context. So Matthew has 28 chapters. So Jesus is uh, near the end of his life. Um, you know, so he institutes the Lord's Supper after this. Um, he goes on trial, he dies, and he's resurrected. And that's the only thing that happens after this. And it's like Jesus is saying, okay, I got some last words. Where are these words going to be? What profound teachings can I give? Um, they're going to shape believers through generations. And Matthew, he writes the book. So Matthew didn't know this when he did it, but this is the most read book in human history. Uh, there's not even a close second place. Matthew's uh, gospel is the beloved gospel that people all over the world are familiar with. And he's saying, okay, we got the end of Jesus' life coming up. Um, what is like the most powerful stories that Jesus told that I can fit in right here? This, the, these last words, if I could have people hear one last thing, what would it be? So... Um, the second story in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 25 is, uh, it, it's about a landowner, and the landowner, um, he's very generous, so the landowner represents God, the people who get the gift that represents us, but the landowner gives, you know, one guy five bags of gold, one person like three bags of gold, and the other person one bag of gold, and so the one that gets the five bags of gold, the three bags of gold, they uh, invest, they take some risk. Um, they do like all the you know important stuff they need to do. The, they double their money, and you know then the landowner blesses them because of that. Next is going to be uh, the one who gets just uh, one bag of gold. So he he's bashful. He's uh, he's afraid. He buries the money. Um, he says, you know, I didn't want to lose it. Uh, and the landowner treats him very harshly. So you know you may not think this is fair, but it's just the way the world works. I mean, some people are uber talented, some not so much. Don't know why we're not, uh, you know, all created with the same amount of talent. Um, but that's just reality. But this becomes like a really, really powerful, cool, good story when you realize, like, you're a blessed person. You have three bags of gold. You got four bags of gold. You got five bags of gold. God has blessed you. Um, and then God, like, he wants us. Uh, he wants what's best for us. He wants us to use these blessings to be a, a blessing to others. This is why this is such a really crazy, cool story. You know, God just says, work hard. Um, use what I have given you to make the world better. Uh, take a few risks. So, like, here's the deal. Like, if you uh, are blessed at listening, then listen to somebody. If uh, you've got some money, invest it in God's kingdom. If you're creative, think about, like, new ways so you can uh, love people and serve people and reach, reach people. Like, if you're good with kids, um, listen to them, play with them, uh, pray with them. You know, develop them to be uh, leaders and servants and disciples. Now, the third story is uh, about um, one person who does a good job, one who doesn't do a good job, so it's similar to the second story. So Jesus gives like these really profound words in the third of three stories in Matthew 25 where Jesus says, I was hungry and you fed me, I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. Um, I was naked and you gave me clothing, I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was uh, sick and in prison and you came to visit me. Um, now, listen to what he says after that, though. So, like, the way we treat the marginalized, the hurting, the poor, the lonely, Jesus says, how you've treated these people then um, is, is how you've treated me. What you've done for the least of these, you've uh, done for me. Now, here at the Wire Sides, we, we work hard. I mean, we take this really literally here. Like, we say, like, you know, how are we doing with these six things? So, like, with the hungry, um, you know, we've collected well over 100,000 pounds of food and given it together at Omaha, and they give it to hungry people here in Omaha, you know, throughout our existence. The Thirsty, we partner with uh, a missionary. She was one of us at one time, Morgan Coyle. She grew up in the church. Um, she lives in Nicaragua, and really what they're trying to do, you know, for the most part is bring fresh water into these cities and villages that have never had fresh water before, things that we take for granted. You know, with... Uh, 
the clothing we um, have given over uh, two truckfuls, semi truckfuls. I mean, that's a lot of diapers. It's like sixty thousand diapers to uh, you know kids here in Omaha to make sure that these little ones um, you know have the clothing that they need uh, you know to be comfortable and healthy. Uh, with uh, the stranger, you know, this is really cool. Like we've taken in three refugee families. Uh, in the last like four or five years, and I remember we the first time we did it was a family that came in from uh, Syria, and Benjamin and I picked him up at the airport, um, and like this was just like this sacred moment where I could just see the church, you know, loving this family. They had y'all had furnished their apartments, um, or their apartment they were going to live in, uh, got them some money up front so they could at least get started, and we took them to their apartment and gave them their uh, gave them the keys to this new place, and you know. You welcome the stranger, you're welcoming Jesus. Uh, you know, the sick, we have the blanket ministry that we, we pray for people who are sick. And, you know, prisoners, um, you know, with release ministries, they work with uh, at-risk and also, uh, you know, teens who are in jail in Douglas and Sarpy County. And if you had asked them who their biggest uh, church partner is, they would easily tell you it's the water's edge. And, you know, we're trying to live out Matthew 25 by... Um, being faithful with what God has given us, and then, you know, serving the marginalized and the poor and the, the hurting. But what we're going to talk about this morning, though, um, is going to be this first story uh, in the Gospel of Matthew. Now, Jesus, he talks about three things uh, more than he talks about anything else. So he's, he's talking about, um, you know, money. He's talking about uh, farming. And he talks about wedding. So the reason he talks about money is because back then and today, uh, pretty much all of us deal with some kind of money every day. He talks about farming a lot because the people he was talking to directly, they're farmers. Uh, that's an agrarian economy. So um, when he talks about seeds and planting and sowing and reaping and pruning and all that kind of stuff, these people get this. And then he talks about weddings. And the reason that he talks about weddings is because these are the single biggest event of the year. There is no party uh, like a wedding, wedding party. So then, in uh, Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 4, then the kingdom of heaven will look like um, ten bridesmaids who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. But the five who were foolish didn't take enough olive oil for their lamps, but the other five were wise enough to take along extra oil. Now, one thing that we can't do in this parable is we can't um, think that a Palestinian wedding uh, 20 centuries ago was the same as an American wedding in the year uh, 2020. Um, they're very different events, and to understand this parable, we have to understand the Palestinian wedding. So in Jesus' time, the whole village, um, they would you know, turn out to uh, accompany the uh, couple uh, to their new home. And they always went on the, the, the longest path that was possible. So everybody in the village, everybody in the town, uh, could greet the, the newly married couple. Now, it's kind of like maybe a way to explain it might be, you know, you have all these uh, birthday parades and graduation parades. I think they're so cool. It's been a blessing to be part of a few of those. And even on the receiving end, y'all came through here and did this to us once. And it was just like an amazing experience uh, for, for the staff here. But imagine, like, here's what it would look like in the Palestinian context. So you have a convertible, the bride and the groom, they're, uh, you know, kind of sitting on there where the trunk ends and the back seat stops. And, you know, they're uh, being driven through, like, the subdivision. They don't go directly to their house. They're going to go through every single road um, in the subdivision because everybody is there to see them. People will drop whatever they're doing. Um, they will cancel their plans, and they will stand in the driveway, and they'll watch this couple drive by, and they'll greet them. It was that big of an event. There would be no exceptions. Everybody would do this. The, the priests and the, the rabbis would even say, like, you can suspend the study of Scripture during the wedding feast because we want you to experience joy, which is part of the Scriptures uh, that you're studying. Now, this point of the story um, lies uh, in the Jewish custom that it's just very different than anything we know. So like here, um, weddings uh, in the Midwest are on Saturday. They typically start at 4.30 in the afternoon. Um, typically they're held in churches. So you get like, uh, you know, in this case, like this handsome, funny, winsome pastor who leads a service for like 30 minutes. And 
then after that's done, uh, you know, the wedding party will, you know, get into like a bus or ollie the trolley or something like that, and they'll go around for an hour and a half, two hours. They'll uh, see the city. They'll take pictures. Um, everyone has gone to the banquet hall that's rented for the night. Um, the wedding party comes into this, you know, great big grand march. Uh, we all have a meal together. There's some speeches. There's a dance, and you really, you know, 10, 30, 11 o'clock, it's over. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's an event that lasts, you know, less than 12 hours. Much different than the Palestinian wedding that we found 2,000 years ago. Now, these would actually start when the groom arrives. Um, you know, so it's like 4.30 here, and could you imagine, like, if the groom is, like, three hours late, people would be freaking out. I don't think anyone would be left. But in the Palestinian culture, it, it starts when the groom is ready to start it, and when he comes... That's when the weddings start. Now, the groom would often arrive late, and so they'd have like this wonderful uh, procession through the village at night where all the bridesmaids would have their uh, you know, lanterns, and like, you know, their faces, I imagine, would almost look, look like angels, all these young people um, you know, walking around this village celebrating you know, the love that God has given you know, a man and a woman. Now, when the bridegroom was delayed, and we saw a delay here, when the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and uh, fell asleep. So this uh, specific groom was taking a sweet time, and the bridesmaids, they became uh, drowsy, and they ended up falling asleep. Now, welcome uh, to the United States in the year 2020. Uh, human condition has always existed. Um, and it's being exacerbated during the current pandemic, and that human condition is boredom. You know, think about those words like drowsy and uh, asleep. Now, boredom um, isn't like a lack of activity. Boredom is uh, boredom's more of like a, a worldview. Boredom is, uh, boredom is our refusal, um, whether we know it or we don't know that we're doing it. It's our refusal to live our best life. So pre-pandemic for many of us, uh, it, was actually, it was actually busyness um, that caused many of us to be bored. Listen to this. You can be busy and bored because you're busy with the wrong thing. You know, so busyness is uh, one of the primary predictors of boredom. Now, pre-pandemic for others of us, it was fear that caused, uh, caused boredom. Now, listen to this one. Fear, is missed, uh, fear and missed opportunities cause 10 times as much pain as failure. You can recover from failure. Um, you can't make a shot that you never take. You know, during uh, the pandemic, then, there's a third type of boredom that I observe. And this is, uh, you know, I keep hearing like a phrase, and maybe you've said this, or you've certainly heard it as well. Yeah, when this is over, I can't wait to do this. Or when the pandemic ends, um, it's going to be so cool that we can go to, you know, X, Y, Z place. Now, Jesus uh, tells us um, in the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 10, that uh, the thief comes to steal and, and to destroy. And he says, I have come so that you may have uh, a satisfying and an abundant life. Now, so what's the thief come to do? The thief comes to uh, steal. Um, he comes to uh, steal our happiness. He comes to destroy our dreams. So what does Jesus do? In, in the days without the pandemic, Jesus comes, um, you know, so that we may have abundance. Like in these days of health and prosperity, Jesus comes to give us abundance. And then during the pandemic and during these uncertain times, Jesus still comes to give us abundance. The thief comes to steal and to take away Jesus, regardless of our human condition, regardless of the culture around us, Jesus comes to give us abundance. Now, wherever you are today, and I really believe this, wherever you are today, um, physically or emotionally, spiritually, relationally, wherever you are today, you can have an abundant day. Um, you know, I know that there's a few of you who uh, lost a job this week. You know, today can be an abundant day for you. You can, you can experience abundance still. Um, there's some of you that are worried about what are you going to do with your kids this summer? Um, you know, the place I usually take them to or the person that usually watches them because the pandemic isn't available. And I don't know what I'm going to do with my kids. Well, you can still have an abundant day today. Um, some of you haven't been affected by the pandemic um, very much at all. It's been pretty much like life as usual, and not a lot has changed for you, and you can have an abundant day today. Um, if you're alone today and you're not going to see another person, you can have an abundant day today. 
And I think there's probably some of you, and I know I miss it, um, you know, being physically present here. I miss you all being physically present here. And some of you miss physically being present here on Sunday mornings, and the life just doesn't seem complete right now. Well, what? You know, here's the deal. You can still have uh, an abundant day. This is essential. This is critical. Boredom is not by chance. Boredom is always going to be by choice. So at midnight, uh, they were roused in verse 6. Uh, by the shout, look, the bridegroom is coming. Come out and come out and, 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 and meet him. So it was midnight, and the groom arrived to the, you know, the, the shouts of the men, the, the beating of the drums, and now all of a sudden, um, it's late at night, and the, the party's getting ready to start, and all the bridesmaids got up, and what they did is they prepared their lamps. So what they would have done here is they prepared their lamps, is they would have, um, like, chopped off probably about the, like, the top uh, half an inch or inch, of their wick that had kind of like um, grown dry and crusty, and they would have like moved the lamp up so the wick comes up, the wick that has been drenched in oil. You know, for those who have oil in their lamps, they will light that, and they have light in their lamp, and things are good. Now, uh, I had to set that up so like we get these lessons from the parable this morning, and here's the first of these lessons for the parable. Lesson number one, and this is just like critical, like, you know, Parents and kids, you're in the same household. Um, really just, like, take note about this one. Talk about this one. Um, you know, if you're a new married couple, like, you know, talk about this. Like, faith can't be borrowed. Faith can only be accepted and develop. You know, your spouse's faith is not your faith. Your parents' faith is not your faith. Uh, your faith is your faith and nobody else's. Nobody else's faith is your faith. So Jesus uh, says that the kingdom of heaven is, uh, is like this. Jesus is the groom. We are the bridesmaids. Faith is the oil. And life is going to happen um, on a schedule that we do not determine. Um, you know, we don't know what life is going to throw at us. None of us a year ago would have predicted that we would be in the middle of a major pandemic. Now I'm going to tell you something that is going to be true for virtually all of us. The pandemic of 2020 is not going to be the most difficult thing that you experience in life. Um, you're going to have bigger challenges than this. You know, you don't know, like, for example, like, when this important relationship you're in ends. You know, we don't know when, um, you know, the kid that we have is going to be overwhelmed by anxiety or overcome by an addiction. You know, we don't know when our job's going to be eliminated. We don't know when we're going to die. We don't know the timing. We only know the certainty that life is not always going to be easy. Now, uh, from the Gospel, chapters uh, 25, 8, and 9, um, then the five foolish ones uh, asked the others, and listen to what they said here. Please give us some oil. Uh, give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out. But the others replied, like, we don't have enough for all of us. Uh, go to the shop and, and buy some for yourselves. So I want you to imagine that, like, you're, like, 10 months pregnant, um, and you live a mile away from the, or you live, um, like, 20 miles away from the hospital. Your car gets 20 miles a gallon. Your water just broke. Um, you know, you're uh, hobbling out to the garage. Uh, your husband's going to take you to the hospital, and all of a sudden your next door neighbor uh, comes up and he asks if he can uh, borrow some of your gasoline because he's got to mow his lawn. You know, would you give him some of your gas? Absolutely no, because you need every drop of that gas to get to the hospital. Or let's, uh, you know, suspend reality and let's just say that, um, you know, Nebraska football was like 11 and 0. In Iowa, football was 11 and 0. You really have to suspend reality on that one. Um, so uh, let's just say it's the day after Thanksgiving. There's a huge game in Lincoln. Um, the winner of that game gets to play like Ohio State for the Big Ten Championship. It's the biggest Nebraska football game for like 20 plus years. And you get to Memorial Stadium. You're so excited. Um, you got a ticket for the person that you and uh, you're there with. And someone comes up to you and says, hey, I've had season tickets for like 50 years. And um, this is like the biggest game. And I, I uh, got my nephew playing in the game. And I forgot my ticket. Can I have your ticket? You probably wouldn't give them the ticket, would you? Um, because you want to see the game. Now, oil in the lamp would have been critical. 
like those carrying the lamp would need the oil to be part of the parade. They would have to have that to be admitted to go to the, the party of a lifetime. Now, the allegory here is that faith can't be borrowed. You know, God invites us, um, you know, to the greatest party ever. Your, your faith is your own. Faith isn't developed in a day. It's, it's developed daily. God invites you then to the greatest party ever. Uh, it's your ticket to the party of faith. But many of us, what we do is we actually treat our heavenly relationship um, like we do many of our earthly relationships. So many of our earthly relationships, like we're polite, um, people are polite to us, it's kind of at a surface level. Now, that type of uh, relationship, um, we're not going to experience intimacy. We're lacking intimacy because something is always in the way. So what I think is in the way is what I talked about earlier, and that's boredom. Um, I've already given you the three reasons why you're bored. Number one is you're busy in the wrong way. Number two is uh, fear is holding you back from your preferred future. And number three is going to be procrastination, that you'll get around to it sometime, but just not quite yet. Now, I want you to think about this, and I want you to believe this, that today, like this morning, right now, this is the day when we start replacing boredom with something greater, and that is abundance. You know, today is the day that uh, you get to fill your lamp with oil. You know, so I know we got a lot of kids watching us. If you're in elementary school, if you're in middle school, I have a son in middle school, I don't want to hear you say, you know, I'm going to just wait for all that God stuff until I get to confirmation. Don't do that. Um, today is the day. You know, young adults, um, you know, might be in high school or college, and I have a son that's in college, and I don't want to hear you say, um, yeah, I'm going to deal with all this Jesus stuff after I graduate from college. I'm going to focus on my classes until then. Don't say that. Today is the day. You know, if you're uh, recently married, um, I don't want to hear you say, like, we're going to have fun for five years, and you know, we'll have kids, and we'll raise them in the church, and then we'll deal with our faith. Don't say that. Today is the day. You know, if, you got, if you're a parent, I got a kid this age, like middle school, high school, and elementary school even, and like you're going to say, well, I'm going to really focus on our relationship with God once this crazy youth sports and all these activities are over. Then, then we'll focus on this. No, don't do that. Today is the day. You know, parents of older children, you might say, well, after my uh, kids leave um, and go off to college, then I'll focus on the God stuff. No, today is the day. Um, you know, I, I remember when Benjamin was born. Uh, this was in northwest Iowa, and uh, there's a man in my church who invited me to come to his office. I, I, I really like this guy. He was a fair man. He was, you know, very hardworking, and I was only about 30 at the time. Um, now, I, I sat down, and he was very serious. We usually kind of, you know, joked around a little bit, but he was very serious, and he says, you know, Craig, um, uh, God is leading me to give you a message. And now, before this time and after this time, this conversation has never gone well. Um, you know, so I just sat there and I said, okay, I'm going to listen with an open mind. Um, I really want to try to understand uh, what this guy's telling me. So uh, I knew his children. Um, they're all about my age. They didn't live in that specific city, but they would come visit a lot and they'd be in church and we'd even hang out a few times. So I, I knew all the adult kids. And, you know, he just, like, he got real serious. And he said, you know, Craig, um, I was on a, a business trip um, in another part of the state when my uh, son took his first steps. And I remember, you know, probably 10 years ago, Craig, uh, I was sitting at my, you know, daughter's uh, high school graduation. And I realized at that point I, I never sat down with her and read her one single book. Um, you know, he, he looked me in the eye and um, he just said, you know, Craig, I, I just, I want you to hear this from me. And you probably already know this, but I, I want you to be a good dad. You know, Jesus can take care of the church. I want you uh, to be a good dad. Now, I was really grateful that he shared that with me. It was what I needed to hear. And, you know, as I look back over the last 18 years, sometimes I've probably done pretty well and, you know, sometimes not so much. But I did believe that God led him to tell me that message. Now, I remember something else, though. I, I remember the look on his face, and it was... Uh, it was a face of pain. It was the face of regret. You know, I, I just, I've been thinking about this conversation this week, and his life was once filled by fear and busyness and procrastination. And now because of that, his life is filled with regret. 
Now, the five foolish bridesmaids, they knew about regret because of number two. And the second lesson we learn from this parable is that faith can't be accepted and developed after it's too late. You can't go and rewrite your life. You can't go and um, time out when your death is going to be. Now, many of Jesus' uh, parables talked about the, the present kingdom that we're in. So they would often say, for the, the, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, or the kingdom of heaven is among us. And then there was like this duality of the kingdom of God that is also like this, uh, this future event. You know, so when we talk about the kingdom of God, when Jesus talked about the kingdom of God, it was two realities. One is now, and one of them is uh, going to be forever. It's, it's, it's eternity. Yeah, I remember a couple uh, years ago, I was um, visiting a young woman in the hospital. She was a college student at the time. She was in a serious automobile accident. They uh, took her by a helicopter to the uh, hospital. She had three, hos- uh, three hospital surgeries before I ended up seeing her. And I went and I hadn't seen her for a few years. Um, yeah, I knew she was in the hospital. Her parents had told me about it. Her mom was in the room with her. And you know, we were kind of doing some small talk. And I noticed at the um, end of the bed was a book that I was familiar with. It was a book that we would have given her about two or three years prior to that when she would have graduated from high school. You know, back then we gave the high school kids a Bible. And it was really cool to me that during life's toughest moment for her, she had her Bible in the room with us. And what this teaches us is something that I already know and you already know as well, that, that the Bible, that God, that a relationship with Jesus Christ helps us in the current kingdom that we live in today. You know, it, it, it's, it's very useful. Um, faith helps us with life today. Now, faith is also uh, going to help us with death. So AJ and I did a funeral yesterday, and AJ and I are going to be doing a funeral tomorrow. So yesterday, it was uh, a woman, her name was uh, Ree. Ree had uh, this, um, this wonderful red hair. Like, she had this smile that it would just, like, totally light up any room that she was in. Uh, Ree was an artist. She was uh, a fourth grade teacher and a fifth grade teacher. She made the most beautiful jewelry. Um, now, yesterday, as AJ was singing and I was speaking, um, you know, Ree's fifth grade son and the second grade son were surrounding um, the husband. And, you know, Ree's most important roles in life were mom and, and wife. And she was great at both those. Now, after the funeral, we drove to this, like, serene, isolated cemetery. It uh, overlooks the, the Nottoway River in uh, southwest Iowa. Um, and I just opened it up and just invited people to share memories, share words, um, you know, share things I'll miss about her. And I don't know if it was 20 minutes, I don't know if it was a half hour, but people just shared, like, the most amazing things. Um, and it was just such a joy to listen to. Now, tomorrow, it's Rob. Um, Rob would have been with us on our first Sunday at Russell Middle School. Rob was on our sit-up and tear-down team. He did that for well over a decade. Um, you know, Rob was a servant leader here at the church. Um, Rob was this funny guy, and he just loved to laugh. And Rob, uh, he was a construction worker. He was big and strong. Um, but Rob also just had this huge heart, and he was most, one of the most compassionate people I know. Yeah, I remember uh, at his wedding, I did his wedding. Um, I remember he, like, he looked into his wife's, uh, Julie's eyes, and I just like, looked at his eyes from the side, and these were the eyes of love. Um, you know, these were the eyes of hope. He was such a proud dad. He loved his daughter, Audrey. She's a graduating senior at Millard West High School. Um, he loved that she was in the show choir, and he was one of those uh, show choir dads. Now, tomorrow afternoon at a serene cemetery in a big city um, off of Center Street. Um, people are going to say the most amazing things about him. Now, let's look at verses 11 and 12 here. Um, later, others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, uh, truly I tell you, I, I, I don't know you. Now, what's interesting is I, I don't think Rob and Ree probably knew each other. Um, you know, this is a big church, and not everybody knows everybody anymore. But I know something about these two people. They both had, like, an abundant and enormous amount of oil in their lamps. You know, their life was uh, not defined by busyness. It wasn't defined by fear. It wasn't defined by distraction. It wasn't defined by procrastination. Their lives were defined by faith. You know, so I got to say yesterday... Um, 
you know, she lived abundantly. And at the end of the message, uh, I got to say, and now she lives eternally. You know, tomorrow I'll get to say, uh, he lived abundantly. And now he gets to live eternally with the God who has created him and is uh, in fellowship with his brother, Jesus Christ. Now, we don't have to exist in fear and boredom and busyness. God gives us another option, and that option is faith. Faith believes that God makes both life and death meaningful. So then I think about the guy that called me to his office. Uh, this story could have had a better ending. You know, he didn't have to work that much. I don't know if it was uh, success or affirmation or influence. I don't know if his security came from money and not the God who has uh, created all things. You know, he could have put his phone down and played catch with the boy. He can pick his phone up still today and call these kids and, and share from his heart and say, you know, it's not too late. Now, your story, it can turn out differently as well. Starting today, you know, right in the middle of the pandemic, starting right now, your story can turn out differently. In lesson number three, it's, it's going to tell us how. Lesson number three is this. Develop your faith daily so that you are prepared for the trials of life and the end of life. You know, make sure there's oil in your lamp. Develop the faith daily so that you're prepared for the trials of life and, and the end of life. Now, you have a choice. Are you content with the knowledge that one day you're eventually going to get around to this intimate, meaningful uh, flourishing relationship with God sometime in the future. Are you, are you content with that? Or is today the day? Today is the day that you draw the line in the sand. You, you say, I'm not going to wait any longer. You know, uh, and Jesus ends the parable, and like Jesus tells us like what the answer is. Jesus says, therefore, keep watch, because you don't know the day or the hour. Life does not happen on our schedule. It just doesn't. As hard as we try, it doesn't. Now, you don't know, and I don't know, when that car, if we're driving home, is going to cross the center line and collide with us. You don't know when your heart stops working. You don't know when your heart is going to be broken. You don't know when your kid is going to develop some sort of problem. So what we do during these days of the pandemic is we hoard things. Like, we hoard things. At first it was toilet paper, and then it was cleaning supplies, and now it's meat. Um... And we are hoarding the wrong things. You know, there, there's no amount of toilet paper. There's no amount of cleaning supplies. There's no amount of meat that is going to give us abundance in this world and eternity in the next world. You know, let today be the day that we start hoarding the most important thing. That's oil in our lamp, faith, because we can never have enough. The saints among us will tell us that we can never have enough faith. You know, not tomorrow, not today. Um, you know, let us start. Let us start hoarding our faith today. Like wherever our oil level is, whether it's bone dry and it's, it's empty, let's put a little water or let's put a little oil in there. And, you know, if it's half full or mostly full, let's put a little bit more oil in there because we don't know what life is going to throw at us. And faith helps us deal with whatever life throws at us. So let me close with this. Like it's, it's procrastination is a, a cruel form you know, of uh, self-destruction. You know, this is why we develop our faith daily, um, not in the future, daily, you know, so that we're prepared for the trials of life and the end of life. Procrastination is a cruel form of self-destruction. So, uh, I mean, you can, if you don't believe me, you can ask the college student, like, who's studying for their finals right now, and if they're trying to, uh, like, cram all this knowledge in and they're taking the test tomorrow, like, they're not going to be ready. Because procrastination is a cruel form of destruction. And you know, that's the guy who uh, you know, kept meaning to get the oil changed in his car, and all of a sudden the engine overheats. Procrastination is a, a cruel form of self-destruction. Don't procrastinate with your faith. You know, stop making excuses why you can't do something and focus all that wasted energy on, on making it happen. So after the funeral yesterday... Um, it was, it was in this beautiful place. Like, the, the burial was just in this gorgeous cemetery. There's this, like, huge oak tree in the middle. It's probably, like, 100 years old, and it basically gave shade, like, to almost all the cemetery. It was a really weird way to get there. Um, there was a, a cornfield on one side and a bean field on one side, and there was this little grass road that we almost had to drive on, probably for about a half mile or so. And then you would turn left, and I'm guessing it was probably about another quarter mile we'd have to drive, and then we got to this... Uh, 
cemetery, so you couldn't get to it from the road. Um, you couldn't walk there. You had to, you know, take the vehicle over the grass road. And um, this thing got done. Um, talked to a few people. Left. So as I was leaving, you know, most of the people there had trucks and SUVs, and um, I don't have either of those. I have a little Volvo. It's a two-door car. Um, it rides very low to the ground, and it turns out that my Volvo didn't have enough uh, clearance to uh, exit. I ran to this bump, and this thing fell off the bottom of my car. I heard it. I turned around, and I saw it. Um, I also saw that there was like a, a trail of um, fluid that was leaking. Um, it turned out some of the farmers figured out that it was my transmission fluid. So that was not how I planned to spend the afternoon and the evening. Um, so I called my insurance company, uh, talked to the insurance company, and said, what, what road are you? Well, I'm not on a road. I'm on this little grassy area between two fields, uh, between a cemetery and a gravel road. And finally figured out where I am. I talked to the towing company. They got to the Volvo dealer uh, here in Omaha. I had to wait a couple hours. So why I was waiting a couple hours, um, there was three farmers who helped me out. Um, one of them towed my vehicle uh, across the grassy road to the uh, gravel. You know, they just made sure I had everything they, they needed. And they didn't want me to wait by my car. They invited me to go to their uh, shed. And so I sat with these three farmers in the shed for uh, a couple hours. And, you know, one of them, the wife came, and the wife of another one came, and the kid came. And we were just having so much fun. Just, I, I think they liked having a guy in a suit um, in their shed. I don't think that ever happened before. But we just talked about farming. We talked about life. Uh, we just talked about everything. And what I'm finally said near the end of my time there, um, you know, this is an expensive funeral for you. And I said, you know what? Like, it doesn't matter. Um, I woke up this morning. I think I had like three friends. And now because of you three, I have six friends. And any day you can double the amount of friends you have, like, that's a really cool day. And, you know, thank you for welcoming me. Thank you for serving me. And it's just a blessing to know, you know, I'll come back and hang out with you guys sometime. I'm not going to bring my car. I'll bring, like, someone else's truck. But, uh... I want to just come out and hang out with you all. This has just been great. Um, now, I was thinking about that this morning. Um, and think about this. If I wouldn't have run into this little dirt thing and my car wasn't so little, um, I would have never met these three farmers. Um, and I'm grateful I did. Uh, I'm grateful I have three new friends. And I want you to think about this. Like, none of us wanted this pandemic to happen and we started hearing news in China, like there's some virus and it might come here. Like, we didn't want that. We didn't want that at all. But it's the way it is. Now, what if, because of something we didn't want to happen, um, but it happened anyway, what if we developed a, a new relationship or a better relationship? What if, like, because we're not so busy nowadays and we're not taking kids to school or Maybe we're not commuting to work, or maybe we don't have as many work responsibilities, or maybe youth sports are, are not going right now, or activities aren't going right now. And what if, because of the simpler life that we're living, um, that we can use that time, and we can use that energy to develop new habits, um, to focus on however high or low our oil level is, um, to increase that level? You know, what if we say, okay, during this season, I'm going to work on my faith. During this season, I'm going to work on my relationship with God. I'm going to let God speak to me. I'm going to intentionally try to listen to him. I'm going to do things that help me grow in this relationship. What if post-pandemic was a lot different than pre-pandemic because of this thing that we did not want to happen? What if we replaced, um, you know, the fear, the busyness, the procrastination, what if we replace that with, with abundance and, and with faith? Now, we can do this, and I don't want you to wait. I want you to start today. Today is today. Um, we don't know the hour of the day when things are going to happen in our life, so let's start today. So let us go to God and let us pray. Lord, first of all, we pray a prayer of confession. Um, Lord, we confess that we've been too busy with the wrong things. We uh, confess that we have been distracted with lesser things and um, have uh, neglected the most essential thing. God, we um, confess that there's been times in our life when our decisions have been guided by fear and not faith. 
God, we confess that uh, there's certainly been times in our life when we have procrastinated in our uh, in developing our, our relationship with you. Lord, we all come in different places. Um, Lord, there's some in this congregation, there's some who are watching right now that their, their lamps are, are almost full of oil, and we, we give you praise for that, and we pray that there's more oil in their lamps and that there's more faith in their life at the end of this day. Lord, there's some uh, whose uh, lamp is pretty darn dry right now, and we're glad the bridegroom isn't uh, coming and starting the wedding right now because we're not ready. And God, I pray for those two polars, and I pray for all of us in between, that you will help us to use the time and the energy and the resources that we have uh, to grow and flourish and develop our, our faith and our relationship with you. You know, God, we thank you for the saints who have gone before us, and they've shown us the way, and they've given us an example. And, and Lord, let's make today the day, not, not even tomorrow. Let's make today the day that we all do something specific and practical and relevant that is going to help us um, have a little bit more oil in our lamp. Lord, we thank you for this gift of faith that uh, gives us abundance. It prepares us for life, and it prepares us for death. And and Lord, we just ask that you open our hands and open our minds and open our hearts to receiving more of the faith that you're wanting to give us. So Lord, as uh, your children, um, and wherever you are, whether you're in a car driving somewhere or whether you're outside uh, enjoying the day, whether you're inside uh, in front of a packed uh, living room in front of a big screen TV, wherever you are, I just invite you to pray with me now. It's a prayer we all know. It's a prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. So as a church in... Uh, hundreds of locations uh, throughout the city and throughout the world. Let us pray together now in, in one voice. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.